Oh, good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Shusett, and I am the resource staff and stated clerk for the Presbytery of the Highlands. It's good to be with you. And in a moment, I am going to share my screen. So if you want to see what I look like, you better take a peek now. Because, thanks to modern technology, I guess, I am going to disappear. If you just came in, if you could enter your name and your church or presbytery or place uh, into the chat, it would be nice to know you're there and where you're from. And if we could, and we should, let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this congregation, for this church, for these people. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, restore the penitent, grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 If you have the document we're discussing, Life Together in the Community of Faith, you're welcome to refer to it throughout. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. I'll be walking us through it all, and you'll see it. And if you find by next week you do wish you had it in front of you, as we go, you will see uh, the link. And I think it was in the um, the email we sent out giving you the link so you could find the document itself. And now you can. My email did not have the document mentioned. Uh, yeah, so I'll make sure it's in the email that goes out for the next um, next session. Um, or, as I said, you'll see the link in just a few minutes. This training is, as you uh, may have read, open to all Presbyterians, members, ordained officers, which is ministers of word and sacrament, elders, deacons, to all church employees, volunteers, Christian educators, commission ruling elders, whatever connection you have with the Presbyterian church. Why is it open to all? Because we are the body of Christ. And what we do affects other people, and what other people do affects us. Everyone is invited because we can all help each other. Any of us might see something happen. It might leave us wondering what's going on, questioning. We might even be troubled by what we've seen. As we're going to see over the next few weeks, Standards that we're about to look at give us a common understanding and a common language so we can go up to someone and say, you know, I went to this training and it said we're supposed to be careful about something. And last week I saw something and I'm not sure what was happening, but now you've got language. Now maybe something you've wondered about is right there in front of you and it'll give you a chance to help someone else and to take appropriate action. An appropriate action could be just bringing it to someone's attention, or it could be something more concrete. It really depends on what the situation is. These standards of ethical conduct were approved by the 210th General Assembly back in 1998, and they were updated just this year to speak to all of the constitutional changes that have happened over the years, especially to the Book of Order. Book of Confessions doesn't change much. The um, Belhar Declaration was um, six, ten years ago. The Book of Order changes just about with every assembly, except the one that was affected by COVID most especially. The full name of this document is Life Together in the Community of Faith, Standards for the Ethical Conduct for Members of the PCUSA, Employees and Volunteers of the PCUSA, and Ordained Officers in the PCUSA. So in the three weeks we have together, I may say life together. I may say standards of ethical conduct. I might, I might just say standards. That's what I mean. And here you can find the uh, link to find the standards of ethical conduct. They are not yet on the General Assembly or PCUSA website. 
So as far as I know, if you don't go here, you won't be able to find it by Googling it. Um, but because of some things that I'll, I'll talk about later, um, we have access to it and I'm able to share it with you now. So if you go to the Highlands website and just plug into the search engine standards, you should be able to find it. And if you have not muted yourself, if you could do that, we would appreciate it. I can't get that. Please mute yourself if you're not yet muted. If you download this document, you will find that there are three sets of ethical standards. Um, first set is for members, but it's not because members are more prone to getting into trouble. It's because there are more members than there are of any other population within the PCUSA. Steve? And because... Yes. Steve, I'm yes. sorry for the interruption, but we're still seeing your original main screen. We're not seeing your um, PowerPoint. Really? Well, thank you for telling me. So you're sure. seeing just this screen. Huh. Well, this will be interesting. Um, give me a second to figure out what I might be doing here. Hmm. That's really too bad. Hmm. Okay, you're still seeing the main screen? Yes. Yes. And I will... PowerPoint has to be open and then you share screen. Yep, I'm sharing. But, but I'm not you, sure why Steve, it's not if you go, Steve, it's Sue. If you go to share screen, it should show you all the open open windows on your PC. So maybe you have the wrong one shared. Me. We'll try again. Thank you. Would you believe me if I told you this is the part I least look forward to? <laughs> yes, I would agree, Steve. <laughs> because we just saw the title screen. Well, it's a fine title, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we doing now? Sting Still looks like screen? the title screen. Same thing. Okay. On All right, so I, I think I know what I'm going to do. Slideshow. There you go. So there you're okay. seeing. The yes. Now we got it. Yeah. Now we got now it. Good. Thanks, it. Steve. Yes. I'm just doing it in a less efficient way. But if it works, that's all that counts. All right. So I'll let me move my head now that I'm in the way here. There you can see the um, screen, the web address to go to... Um, get this document if you don't have it. And if you go to just Google Highlands Presbytery, search, enter standards of ethical conduct, it should pop up. But again, you don't need it for tonight. Um, as I was saying, there are three sets of standards. Um, and the first one in the booklet is for members. And it's not because members get into more trouble than ordained officers, employees, or volunteers. It's because there are more members in the church than there are of any kind of other population. And so there's that truth. And then there is, because of the priesthood of all believers, What's true for members of the PCUSA is a baseline of what's true for everyone who is an ordained officer, a commissioned ruling elder, a commissioned educator. What's true for members are true for the rest of us as well. For employees and volunteers, we'll see where there are some differences. Because many, but not all of the standards overlap, you're going to see a little back and forth as we go through. There are some standards that are very much the same between two or three of the groups, but have slightly different wording. There are fewer standards for the employees and volunteers because the particularly faith-based standards 
can't be applied to employees and volunteers across the board. And we'll talk about some of the complications there. Um, and quite a few of them apply only to ministers of word and sacrament and commissioned ruling elders because of their particular responsibilities. But again, we need to know and be aware of all of them because it's not just making sure that you do the right thing. You're all here to help the rest of us do the right thing. And so you might be wondering, why do I have to worry about those other people? Well, because we're the church. That's our job. We worry about other people. These standards of ethical uh, conduct were commended as a model to presbyteries and synods for study, approval, and inclusion in manuals of operations, and to congregations as a model for study, approval, and use with sessions, new member classes, adult education classes, personnel committees, and in contracts, to seminaries, for members, employees, and volunteers, for those serving in general assembly entities, and those instructed and, to, and instructed those entities to include those standards in their personnel policies. Why am I telling you all this? Because, strangely enough, even though this document came out in 1998, it has never been provided in those ways, really. The booklet's there. There's the material we'll be sharing. But... It appears this is the first attempt to provide an actual study guide for these standards of ethical conduct. And so um, I will be sharing what I do with um, members of the Office of the General Assembly, and I'll, I'll mention that to you all later. So how can you use these standards? It's officer training season for a lot of churches, although it's a year-round thing like stewardship. For your session meetings, your deacon, board of deacons meetings, your committee meetings, you can use it as a supplemental boundary training. And I say supplemental because every presbytery is going to have to figure out what its policy is. I can pretty much assure you their policy is not going to be come to the Presbytery of the Highlands officer training and you're good to go. They're going to set something else up. However, your being here gives you a step up. Because whatever you do, chances are they're not going to be going into as much detail as we will be. This is a good thing to share with new member classes, even if it's the member standard only. Same with employees and volunteers, even if it's just that standard only. Because if you don't talk to people about these things, and generally speaking, we haven't done a great job of doing that, we shouldn't be surprised when something happens. We can't forget about it, but we can't be surprised that people don't know what we expect if we don't tell them what to expect. And so um, these are all ways in which we'd all benefit from this being shared. Trigger warning. You might be used to trigger warnings from um, things like uh, movies or TV shows where they say, be careful, there's smoking, there's um, rough language, there's sexual content. Um, some of those things are going to come up, to be sure. That's not really what uh, I don't want you to be necessarily worrying about what it says in the movies or TV, but it is a good sign for things. Excuse me, I'm having trouble finding my... Hmm. Hang on just a second, okay? Mm. 
I'll talk to my editor about editing this part out. Hmm. Nope, that's not. If I change this, does it change for you? It has it's have... still the trigger warning, Steve. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> and is it it's still trigger warning now or did it move? No, it did not move. Okay. Hmm. Hey, Steve, I'm here. This is Sonia. Can I help you? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to juggle multiple screens at one time, and I'm not doing as well as I hoped I would be doing. I cannot so, help you with that. <laughs> well, then what good are you? <laughs> I, I just got on to let some people in. Oh, thank you. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll be quiet. Call on me. No, no. Hello. Hello. Oops. Okay, now if I move. Now let's see. If you stop sharing and start again. So there you go, Steve. It went to references and back yeah, to Yeah, I I think um I may have to get out of I have to share my screen, obviously, but maybe I just need to share it the old fashioned way, unfortunately. Let's try this again. Let's be basic. Now, I am aware that for some people, uh, seeing trigger warnings, they think that's uh, a sign of weakness, that you, you've got to be tough. You shouldn't have to worry about those things, except we're the church. And so our job is to worry about other people. We're supposed to be caring about other people. We aren't necessarily going to be doing what movies do. We're not going to be showing you any violence or swearing or anything like that. No smoking on my end of the screen. But we will be talking about examples of things that happen. And if you were doing this, if you use this recording on your own with your session or whatever group, you'll have a chance to talk about examples from your life. Um, things that may have happened in a church you once attended. Things that have happened in the church that you are... Uh, going to now. And you may find that you were happy not remembering those things. You were just as glad to have forgotten about them, except now we're going to be talking about them or something just like them. So if you find that you're getting upset, you can turn the sound off. You can mute me. You can walk away and walk around the room and come back. Give it a few minutes till we moved on to something else. Um, and if you really want to know, you can watch the recording later and, and zip ahead to when I talk about that thing. But I want you to, um, I don't know what that is. Um, if you find yourself getting upset, don't continue being upset. That is not at all what I'm looking for. If you've been in the church for any length of time, You've probably seen and heard or even experienced things that you know you shouldn't have. Those things shouldn't have happened, and you should not have had to experience them. It's also possible that in your life in the church, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You've not experienced anything that bad in your life in the church. And then I can say, thanks be to God. I'm glad that's been your life. And I hope it continues to be your life. Just bear in mind, that isn't how it's been for everybody. And so if someone's got uh, a face that looks like they've seen death warmed over, they just might have. 
And so just be caring for them. If you look through this document, you will see that there are two sections that follow each of the standards. There are references and there are examples. The references are from scripture, the book of confessions, the book of order, and there are actually, which should be noted, a couple of policy statements from the Presbyterian Church USA. The other side of it is that um, these are meant to be illustrative, not exhaustive examples. So you are going to um, see four examples generally on each slide that we get to for this. That's not saying these are the only ways this occurs. It's saying here are four ways to think about it. And if you're doing a study, you have four things to get the ball rolling. And then generally speaking, nature will take its course. And people will say, you know, I once heard, or somewhere along the way, I heard something happened. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the main thing is, being nondescript is the best if you start to share examples from your own life. You know, when I belong to that church, this is what happened. Don't give the name of the church. Don't tell the name of the person who did the thing. Um, just... I was in a church once where is best. Don't forget the good things to talk about because there are good things. Um, and um, we're the Church of Jesus Christ. We're about sharing good news. So um, oh, excuse me. So make sure you share good stories. And you'll find as we go along, that we do talk about good stories ourselves. Hmm. Hang on just a second. I'm still trying to figure something out here. Hmm. Finally, Matthew is very helpful, as we'll see throughout this study. And in particular, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? If you pay any attention to the news, um, I subscribe to the religious news service, uh, email blast every day. Rarely does several days go by when I don't hear about somebody in some church who did something that they shouldn't have. And there are a lot of Christians around the world, a lot of religious people around the world, even beyond Christians. Presbyterians don't show up a lot because we're a million plus people. And so we're not the biggest number of Christians or religious people. So it would be easy to go, oh, look at them, look at them, look at them. Well, remember, we do have a speck in our own eye. We have a log in our own eye. We have a history. We have the PCUSA where things have happened that shouldn't have. We have predecessor denominations where things happened that shouldn't have. And uh, as a consequence, um, we could be just as guilty and are just as guilty as other denominations are over the course of our history. So bear that in mind when you're sharing stories, not to go, oh, thank goodness we're not like them. Beat your chest in the temple and all that jazz. Because we'll talk a lot about humility. And a first step of humility is uh, there, but for the grace of God, might I be going? Might our church be going? May I ask what you're seeing right now? References and examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. I keep thinking if I hit another button, something magic will happen, but nothing magic is happening. Mm. 
Well, maybe I figured something out here in my panic. References as examples is still there? Yes. Thank you. And now? Now it changed. Change, yeah. It changed to okay. do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. In the standards, they refer several times to the ordination vows, and we will be referring to them several times in our time together. Um, these vows are here to set the standard to shape our life and our ministry. That's what they're, I, I want to say they do shape our life and ministry. But the reason we have these standards and need them in the first place is because we are not yet fully shaped in our life and ministry. We fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of these standards that are before us. We fall short of these ordination vows. That's where grace and God's forgiveness come in, as well as God's gift through the church of the Bible and the Constitution, the Book of Confessions and the Book of Order. But the Church of Jesus Christ is understood in the Presbyterian Church USA as the focus of this, and it's not just about those who have been ordained and have to answer the questions you see in front of you. We're all about the priesthood of all believers, and God has called each of us and endowed each of us with gifts that we are here to share. And in the same way, on every single one of us associated with the Church, there are responsibilities and expectations upon us, and again, we're all accountable. This standard is for all members, which includes officers and Christian educators, but not necessarily employees and volunteers, who we'll see have their own standards to live up to. Which isn't to say members have to live up to these standards, but they're in a position where they can help others who need to be following and needing these ordination vows to do so. And here you can see the promises you as members make. Do we, the members of the church, accept these people chosen by God through the voice of this congregation? Do we pray for them? Do we encourage them, respect their decisions, follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? And at an ordination or an installation, you're asked to say what you believe, and generally speaking, people say yes. That's what you're promising. And when it comes to your pastors, your commission ruling elders, your um, Christian educators, you promise to pay them fairly, provide for their welfare, to stand by them in trouble, to share in their joys. Will you listen to the word that they preach? Welcome their pastoral care, honor their authority as they seek to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord. Next time you're miffed at someone in leadership in your church, if you're a member or if you're a fellow officer in the church, don't forget that's a promise that you have made. And you have to figure out how do you live by that promise. After all that buildup, oh, hang on. Hmm. We're finally going to get to the standards. I think. Maybe not. Ay, ay, ay. Hmm. A few years ago, many of you might remember that WWJD was plastered over everything. T-shirts, mugs, posters, anywhere you can imagine Christian books and gifts are sold. There was a whole shelf of what would Jesus do. 
And we will see in a few moments, Jesus Christ is the pattern for my life and ministry. But what I would like to suggest to you is that that isn't actually enough to wonder about. Because the challenge is, we really don't know what Jesus would do in any number of situations. When I'm really in the mood to give someone a hard time, I'll say, you know, Jesus couldn't hit a curveball and he couldn't drive a stick shift. So if you ask Jesus, what do I do? Jesus doesn't know. He just doesn't know. There are a lot of real life situations where we don't know what Jesus would do. Scripture isn't always consistent, even in accounts of Jesus' life and teaching. So we talk about Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Well, sure, in Matthew, Jesus says, put your sword away. In Luke, he says, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. He even then says later, two swords are enough. Okay, what do we make of that? In Matthew, Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. And in Mark, he says, whoever is not against us is for us. If you see a fig tree without fruit, do you curse it? Or do you give it time to see if it produces fruit later? And then there are times in scripture where honestly, I don't know what is going on. Someone wants to explain after this is over what it means about a strong man being bound up. I would be glad for the explanation. But I've had seminary professors look at me and say, even those who have written commentaries on these books go, we really don't know what they mean, what Jesus meant. So that's reality. If we read scripture, we see Jesus' birth eight days later at his, his circumcision, two years later when he and his family flee Egypt. We see him at 12 years old when he stays in the temple after his parents had left. And then we see a little more detail, a lot more detail, really, of the last three years of his life until his crucifixion, and then we hear about miracles that followed. That is not a lot. And even with what we have in those last three years, John writes, there are so many other things that Jesus did that if every one of them were written down, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so this one book, the Bible, as invaluable and as life-changing as it is, is not a complete record of everything Jesus said and did and thought. If you go to our website, uh, Highlands Presbytery, and you look up Coming Alive in Christ, you will find a uh, three-part study that we did last year. It goes through the ordination questions, and it talks a lot more about how it is we read Scripture. And that's an important piece. We don't have time to cover that, obviously. But you might, if you aren't familiar with it, want to re look up that stuff. Because some of the most divisive issues today, abortion, same-sex relationships, um, in vitro fertilization, Jesus does not say anything about those things in particular. And if you look through all of Scripture, any specific comments are few and far between rarely very clear, rarely consistent, and it doesn't matter what side of the position you're on, you're not really going to find substantive proof for what you are looking for on those. It's a question of how Scripture interprets Scripture, what the law of love tells us about reading the text, and then we need to draw our own conclusions. We need to discern what Jesus would have me do. Not just wonder what Jesus would do. What would Jesus have me do? We have all this stuff that's not as consistent as we'd like, that isn't clear. Jesus, recognizing that we are pretty human and pretty fallible, gives us a simpler explanation for his pattern of life. What is the great commandment? Well, the first one is love God. Second one's just like it, love your neighbor. Well, I wish simple meant easy. 
What would Jesus have me do? How do I live, love God, love neighbor? Jesus is asked by someone, who is my neighbor? He tells one of the most famous religious stories around the world, regardless of your faith tradition. But that doesn't mean we all agree on who our neighbor is or how we're supposed to treat our neighbor. So Jesus gets really clear, really concrete. He's told us love God, love neighbor. Maybe we understand better. That doesn't mean we always want to do it. Is there anybody out there you should be forgiving? Is there anybody out there from whom you should be asking forgiveness? Jesus is pretty clear. That's a big deal. But if you're like me and like much of the world, that isn't always easy to do. Again, there are times when Jesus is pretty clear. How much do you give of your time, money, and energy to feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming strangers, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the imprisoned? How much time do you spend on any one of those? Don't even worry about doing all of them. Jesus is pretty clear. If you do that for somebody else, you're doing it for him. Just because we understand doesn't mean it's easy or something we're ready to do. So here we are, finally, the standards of ethical conduct. Let me now say to those of you who have come to join us in the last 15 minutes and wondering, did you walk in the middle of the show? Yes, as a matter of fact, you sort of did, and my apologies. Um, because of a mistake on my part that I, I just didn't catch uh, something that happened, we started tonight at 7 instead of 7.30 because a number of people were already here. And so I encourage you, when we're done, to go back and watch the portion of the recording that you missed. You know, as you can see, we're just now getting to the actual standards. There's been a lot of build up to this point. Um, and so uh, I apologize for your coming on late. It's all on me, but um, I hope you'll understand. And next week, we will be starting at 7.30 just as we promised. Well, I thought we promised. We promised too much. So, life together in the community of faith. The three preambles. Each, each book of the three booklets begins with a preamble. Member, ordered ministry, which means someone who has been ordained a ministry of word and sacrament, ruling elder or deacon, and as an employee or volunteer. And hmm, you really don't need to see me that much. So you can see that as a member, you accept in obedience to Jesus Christ, I accept Christ's call to be involved responsibly in the ministry of faith, ministry of the church, excuse me, Confirm that Jesus Christ is the pattern for my life and ministry, and relying on God's grace, commit myself to the following standards of ethical conduct. For those who are in order ministry, they affirm the vows made at their ordination, and then commit to the same basic things, right? Rely on God's grace, commit to the standards. As an employee or volunteer, you simply commit yourself. Simply, I don't mean to say is any less than. That is exclusively what you're doing. No reference to Jesus Christ, nothing about your life and ministry. You're not relying on God's grace, but you are committing yourselves to these standards. So again, we see Jesus Christ is the pattern for my life and ministry and relying on God's grace. Well, what does it mean that Jesus is the pattern for my life and ministry? In Matthew, we see the first of the references we're given to serve and not be served. Don't act from selfish ambition, but humility. Don't look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. Jesus is our pattern. He's the one against whom we are to measure ourselves, as we'll see in more detail soon. 
but he is a measuring stick against whom we are always going to fall short. Only when we are most consumed by the grace of God do we even come close to living up to the, the life and pattern that Jesus set. Those moments will be few and far between when we are so untainted by self-interest or ego or whatever motivations we have that we're really doing it for the same reasons in the same way Jesus did. That is true for our whole lives. The grace of God is that when we fall down, God will help us to get back up again and again as long as we shall live. What we need is the spiritual gift of humility. Now, some people take that to mean not naming and celebrating your gifts. And as Presbyterians, our tradition can actually be pretty rough on thinking about anything about us is good. Um, and depending on the church you attend and your theology, um, what we used to call it, and taken from John Calvin, but in seminary we'd say, worm theology. Because John Calvin said, compared to God, we're just worms. That may be our history, but in my opinion, it isn't healthy or helpful or even accurate. Because in the beginning, God made all things and declared them good. And it wasn't until the fourth century that St. Augustine came up with original sin, and that's carried the day. But that is not the only way to understand who we are in the eyes of God, God who calls us beloved. Humility is not about hiding our gifts or denying our contributions. It's about being grounded in who we really are. Humus, and I don't speak Latin, but I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. Humus, H-U-M-U-S, is the Latin word for ground. It's to see ourselves as we really are, not putting ourselves down or praising ourselves up, but understanding and being who God made us to be and living, being sanctified into who God is calling us to be. Now, you might be thinking, this isn't a theology class. Why does that matter? Well, if we think I'm sinful and there's nothing I can do about it, I am a worm, then we might well give into what we think we should otherwise resist. But what does it matter? I'm a worm anyway. I'm a terrible person. I might as well do what terrible people do. If we get down on ourselves, oh, I'm no good. Well, beating ourselves up leads to depression. It leads to temptation to find ways to dull that feeling of inadequacy. People drink because they don't want to feel inadequate. They take drugs. They engage in sex outside of what is healthy. All sorts of things happen. They watch too much TV. They're on their phone too much because they don't want to think they are inadequate. Well, I'm here to tell you, God loves you. That makes you adequate enough. But if we forget that, we can get into trouble. And on the flip side, when it comes to praising yourself up, if you think you are always right, that means the person who disagrees with you is always wrong. That's a dangerous place to be. If you start to think I'm here to win because I'm right, I'm not here to solve the problem. You are not contributing to the kingdom of God. You're contributing to your kingdom, which is very different than the kingdom of God. I'm not, I'm not sure if someone's talking to me or if they need to be muted. Okay, I'll assume they needed to be muted. And so we commit ourselves to the following ethical standards. Did I go too far?
Do everything for the glory of God. Don't seek your own advantage. Be doers, not just hearers. And from the foundations of Presbyterian polity, open to reform of its standards of doctrine as well as governance. And at the bottom, you can see the translation of the motto of the Reformed Church, of which we Presbyterians of the Presbyterian Church USA are part. The church reformed always to be reformed because it's God who does the reforming. We don't reform ourselves. A church reformed because we're reformed Christians always to be reformed according to the word of God in the power of the spirit. God is reforming us, but not willy nilly. This is according to our understanding of what God means in the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. You might be right. You might have history and tradition on your side. You might be a great biblical scholar, and you might have support from the Book of Confessions and the Book of Order. But again, humility demands that we be no more than 99% sure, to be 1% open to the possibility that maybe there's something more or something different. Or, I know it's crazy, you might be wrong. You have to be open 1% at least to that possibility. These ethical standards also exist for employees and volunteers and for church members who come under as an employee or a volunteer. Although this is a different study, although ethics will come up in this, it can be very challenging when you are an employee who is a member. And it can be it can be challenging in that one respect because if you're the church secretary or the church treasurer and you're there to worship on Sunday, you better have some pretty clear boundaries or everybody's going to be coming and saying, I sent in a check three weeks ago. Why hasn't it been deposited yet? And it's challenging for the leadership of the church because things don't always go as smoothly as we'd like. And it's hard to tell a member they aren't always doing the best job because you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want them to get mad. You don't want them to leave. And so you sit on your hands and you bite your tongue because it's easier, even if problems that we sit on have a tendency to grow. When it comes to employees and volunteers, you need to be careful. You can't ask an employee or a volunteer to pray. You can say to the group that you're with, does anybody want to pray? And if they jump in, hey, great. But if they don't, and you look to the person who does, or like any other leader, you may end up praying because nobody else volunteers. Recognize the difference. They, these are all called standards of ethical conduct. Standards we all abide by. It's an expectation of appropriate behavior. Those across the board, ordained officers, members, employees, volunteers. A covenant is a promise from and to God. Your employees and volunteers are not bound by the covenant because you have no idea, nor do you have the right to ask, if they even believe in covenants, believe in God. That's out of bounds. You, as a Christian, as a Presbyterian, you need to treat employees and volunteers as the children of God that in faith we understand them to be whether they see themselves that way or not. But you can't expect them to act in a particular way apart from the standards that you have all agreed to and your personnel policy. So when it comes to a Christian holiday, maybe they work, maybe they don't. I mean, if you're closed, they might be closed. They might say, I'm going to come in and do some work. Um, you can't have them ascribe to any particular theology. You like to use inclusive language when it comes to God. They refer to God as he all the time. You live with it. You can tell them, well, just so you know, in our church, this congregation, we tend to think of God in more inclusive language. But if they don't feel like changing, they don't have to. You're just informing them. You're not correcting them. 
reprimanding them, requiring of them. You're just sharing who you are and what you believe. Um, when it comes to repentance, humility, and forgiveness, you got to be careful. You as a Christian understand them one way. These words have civil, secular meanings as well. People outside the church know what it means to repent, but you got to be careful how you frame it because they may not understand it the same way, and you're imposing if you just lay it on too thick. There are ethical standards for members, but there are some members who, as I said, are also volunteers or members. And that's going to require some discernment, and you're really going to have to pay attention to the circumstances and context in which you find yourself. Because a member in one place is a volunteer or employee in another place, and you can't hold them all accountable in the same way. Um, because those standards are different. So you might be at a meeting and someone is glad to pray when they're in that meeting. But when you're with them at the food pantry and you pray with all the volunteers beforehand and you say, does anybody want to pray? Don't call on that person, even if they volunteer at every committee meeting, because they may just not feel comfortable in that context. doing that. And it's your job not to put them on the spot. You're to be caring for them, and they're there as a volunteer. Now, you might think that's crazy. How could you be willing to pray in one place and not willing to pray in the other? Well, I have taken ordination vows as a deacon and as a minister of word and sacrament, and I've taken installation vows in several, four places. Um, and had we more time, I would have taken the vows with you tonight if we could have done them all together. I took vows when I got married. I took vows over my children when they were baptized. I didn't, I didn't blink. I rushed into that willingly. However, I was also elected to be judge of elections in our township. And when I had to go before the judge had been sworn in, I found, without really thinking that much about it, that I had to ask the judge to let me affirm those promises because all I could think of was, Jesus said, don't even swear on your head. And I thought I, I needed to say to the judge, I, I can't, I can't, I do solemnly swear. It just felt wrong. So it happens, it happens. And so we reach the first section of the particular standards that are before us. So up until this point, we have been looking at um, the broad overall standards. That's what we looked at. Now we're looking at the first part. Will you promise that with God's help, as a faith, as a person in order ministry, you'll be faithful to the gospel consistent with your public ministry as a member? faithful to the gospel and consistent with your membership in the church. And as an employee or volunteer, you will conduct your life in a manner that will support the ministry of your workplace. So you can see there's a lot of overlap, but there are significant differences. Members aren't promising to be consistent with their public ministry. Employees aren't even looking to be faithful to the gospel. In this section of references, um, you will see, this is the first time we've seen it, in the actual document, there are five. I'm only giving you an excerpt most of the time because there's way too much for a PowerPoint slide. But um, I'm going to take advantage of being able to see you all now. And I would like to ask John Pfaff, would you mind reading from 1 Timothy 4? Teach believers with your life by word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching. And that special gift of ministry you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed. 
keep that dusted off and in use. Cultivate these things, immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted, just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. Thank you, John. Now, I will tell you up front, 1 Timothy 4 is not one of the references in this document. However, it is for me an incredibly powerful central text to who I am as a minister of Word and Sacrament, as a Christian. Um, and at one point, my title in a place was Teaching Presbyter. And when people would say, what does that mean? I would read 1 Timothy 4 from the message to them. It's not a reference given, but I think it's very applicable here. What is your, what is your life about? You are to teach believers with your life. Shakespeare says, all the world is a stage and all the people merely players. It's not just about believers. All the world is a stage. You are teaching the world with your life. People who believe, who don't believe, who want nothing to do with the church. When you don't yell at them and you had every reason to yell at them and you demonstrate grace, you have shown them what it is to be a believer. A person cuts you off on the road and you don't hit your horn or do something else creative to communicate your displeasure. They may, when they calm down, realize, huh, that person was awfully nice to me when I was in the wrong. I wonder what that's about. You're teaching believers with your life. Shakespeare said we are all merely players. There's nothing merely to it. Each one of us can be a light on a hill to someone. God is always seeing us. People are seeing us. And if our light is not hidden under a basket, we have something to teach them with our lives. What we say, how we act, by our love, by our faith, by our integrity, when it seems like Nobody would ever know. We know and we know God knows. Again, not to belabor the point, but we all fall short of the glory of God. It's not about ordained people being perfect, or any Christian or any person being perfect. But the sad truth is, we all do fall short of the glory of God. And when a church leader does that, it becomes even more noteworthy. The pastor's name is often on the signboard, in the bulletin. When people come in and say, I'm a stranger, who should I talk to? Depending on the church, you may point them toward the pastor. They come, people come often, whether they should or not, just to hear the pastor preach. There was an article written a couple of years ago by Russell Moore, who is a, a pastor, and um, we can go into that at another time, perhaps. But he writes the article out of the experience of a friend who had been, um, whose um, errors of his ways have been discovered. Uh, they had been found out for immorality. And so Russell Moore talks about the betrayal and shock and anger that he felt. This person should have known better than to do this. Moore says it took him some time to realize that this isn't a matter of knowledge, but of sinfulness. That we might act in an immoral way is no surprise to God, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who reads the Bible. It won't be at the end of our time together, because you're going to see people of all sorts acting in ways that you shouldn't see people act. In the Bible, we see leaders like kings and prophets and apostles with great flaws. The fact that we're shocked when our leaders fall is a demonstration that we are not nearly as realistic about human nature as the Bible is. 
Now that is not to forget about it, to dismiss it, to minimize it. It's just to say, and I can say it myself, there are times when I'll say, I don't understand how this person could do that. Well, that's just diverting attention from what's important, which is something has happened and how do we care for the person, care for the people affected, respond to the situation. But grabbing my head and going, how could this happen? Well, that really shouldn't be a, a question. It's disappointing, be frustrating, it can make us angry, livid, furious, but surprised only because we just didn't see it coming, not because we can't imagine it happening. For employees and volunteers, they will conduct their lives in a manner that will support the ministry of their workplace. That really applies to all of us. And work is, I know uh, there was a time, and I guess it probably still happens now, when people will say, particularly to women, honestly, so do you work? As if the work they might do out in the world is one thing, and the work someone surmises they might be doing as a wife or mother is a different thing. And then some women would say, well, yes, I work. I just don't get paid for it. Or yes, I work. I just don't have to leave home. Hopefully we're getting past that stuff. And the fact that I'm stumbling over how it could work, I'll take as a good sign on my behalf. But we all are in a workplace. We're all on stage. The workplace defines and expresses what manner of life employees and volunteers ought to live, that we all ought to live. And we live up and we live down to expectations. So if you're at a church service, if you're uh, volunteering, if you're in a committee meeting, uh, whatever the case may be, members getting together just to have fun and they're just having a good time. If the people there act in a certain way, then the people who are there, who are watching, who are new, are going to think that's the right way. That's acceptable. We can do that. So if you're there and you get drunk, they're going to say, well, this is a church where it's okay to get drunk. If you swear up a storm, they're going to say, well, I guess that's okay. Whatever you do, if you hold the door open for someone when they walk in. They're going to say, wow, that's the kind of church that is hospitable and opens the door for folks who come in. It goes all different ways. If people wear tasteful t-shirts to the food pantry and they say, yes, wearing a t-shirt is perfectly understandable, but it's got to be a tasteful t-shirt. See mine? Then people are going to understand. They might tell them, you know, we understand that you're, you're just here. Maybe we'll get you a free t-shirt from the church because we have too many of those t-shirts we made up. Or you get one from the clothing closet that your church has so they don't feel uncomfortable because now you've demonstrated to them, we're a church where we, we do things a particular way. And you didn't know, no hard feelings, but if you don't want to turn your shirt inside out, maybe you could do this thing. Um. If they see rules being bent for some, but you're strict for others, they'll see that that's the way to do business. The food pantry says you get one carton of eggs, but you're a friend, you come to church, I'll give you two cartons. Wink, wink, it'll be fine. The new volunteer is going, okay. At the very least, I'm not sure how this works, but it's clearly not the rules that are printed for everybody counts. And if the employee or volunteer acts in a way that's counter to the church's way, you have to, as someone who's a member of the church, as a leader in that context or in the church, you need to get over your discomfort with the whole thing and say something to that person so they know. Because if you don't say anything, they have no reason to know and they'll keep doing it and you'll keep getting upset and other people will get upset. And next thing you know, a big fire happens when all it took was saying, if you could wear a different t-shirt next time, that'd be great. Can we get you something else or can you turn yours inside out? Again, we can't make them pray, but we can encourage them, invite them 
demonstrate what it is to be respectful of what it is when someone's praying. They may have no context for the church, no history with it. All of a sudden, someone says, let's pray, and they're, okay, what do we do now? They look around, and they see all of you close your eyes and bow your heads. Some of you might clasp your hands together. You have now witnessed to the glory of God. And you've taught them, okay, next time they come and someone says, let's pray, all right, close my eyes, bow my head. I don't like the hand thing, but I'll close my eyes and bow my head. You've taught them something important. I mentioned earlier the importance of Matthew 7 on ethical behavior, and we could do a whole Bible study on it. We talked about the speck and the log, and now here we are with the golden rule. The measure you give will be the measure you get. In Matthew 7, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. Here, understand that a rule is not about ruling over. Being a ruling elder is not about ruling over. It's about against whom do you measure yourself? When you think to yourself, I feel lost in the faith. I don't know which end is up. I don't know what I should do. I don't know what I should think. I don't know how I, I don't know what to do. I hope you can think about your ruling elders as much as you might the teaching elder. But as a ruling elder, so named because they are chosen by the congregation to discern and measure its fidelity to the word of God. Measure yourself, not to compare yourself and beat yourself up, to say, okay, this is what it means to be a faithful person. This ruler, this ruling elder, this is what they do. Okay, how can I try and live as much as my life allows like that? So you're measuring yourself, not for comparison, but to get a sense of what, what does seven inches look like? I don't know. Get a rule rub. Okay, that's what seven inches look like. Well, did I cut that piece of paper exactly right? No. And with paper, you can't. But with humanity, you can. So that's what it means to be a, gold, uh, to be a ruling elder. There you can see the, the headings again, and this is for ordered ministry and for members. What does it mean? If, some, if you could mute yourself, whoever's unmuted, please. You will conduct your life in a manner that is faithful to the gospel and consistent with your public ministry or your membership. Therefore, you will, and here you can see how the settings are laid out. Section one, standard one. So that's section one with the Roman numeral. Standard one with the Arabic noodle, that numeral, and that's how it looks in the booklet. You will practice the disciplines of study, prayer, reflection, worship, stewardship, and service. You'll also see there's nothing here for the employer volunteer because they don't have to abide by disciplines of study, etc. This it also, in addition to uh, Matthew 7, would be very good for a uh, study at your church. What does it mean to participate in disciplines of study, prayer, reflection, worship, stewardship, and service? How are they a part of your life now? How do you practice them? When do you practice them? How often do you practice them? Which ones don't you practice, but you think about, you wonder about? Um, what we you might want to experiment with. What you are promising as a minister of word and sacrament, ruling elder, deacon, member, is that you will do these things. Not just one of them, but to some degree, all of them.
Here you'll see a reference from the Directory for Worship, and I lift it up because of this particular phrase, affecting the lives of the people. Maybe that means knowing and praying for your community. Maybe it means specifically your congregation. Or maybe it means more generally people beyond your community, all people, everywhere. It means paying attention to what's going on in the world so you can pray for them, so you can lift up their needs. And for you as a member, as a ruling elder, as a minister of word sacrament, as a deacon, are you being led to address these realities in some particular way? Does it lead you to move from mentioning uh, Israelis and Palestinians in your prayer to saying, we need to send postcards to our Congress people and senators with what we think they ought to be doing? Are we moved to action? Because yes, it's great to see on a signboard prayer changes things. But the truth is much of the time prayer changes things because first prayer changes us and then we are motivated. That's true, not just for preaching, but anytime you're reading scripture, anytime you're praying, anytime you're paying attention to the world. Read the Bible with one hand, the newspaper with the other. And so we come to the example section that I mentioned to you um, earlier on in this. And this is our first set of it. And here you can see four different examples. There are examples that have a minus sign. Those are negative examples. There are positive examples with a plus sign. And then you can see at the end, if you were doing this study at your church, do you have other examples? Now, again, I can't talk about all of them, but you have all the standards, you have all the references, you have all the examples, you can do this on your own. In this case, I'm lifting up the second one. A minister becomes so wrapped up in church responsibilities that she drops her daily personal time for prayer and study. There are always things to do for all of us. You don't have to be a minister to have that truth. Um, and these are often good and valuable things, and they're valuable to God and to other people. It's like, who can complain about that? They're, they're busy all the time. They're doing great stuff. Except there are a number of those disciplines we promise that we will live out, not just service. So if you think about it like your diet, what is healthy nutrition? Eating any one of the four food groups is a good thing. The idea is to eat all four food groups. There was a guy I knew who ate peanut butter because it was protein, it was vegetarian, he had all these things. And he could say, look, I'm eating from that particular food group. So his parents would get off his back. When his hair started falling out, he realized there's a reason why there are four food groups and not just one. This minister is wrapped up in service but not taking time for prayer and study. Just as a side note, um, when I was at the General Assembly, my responsibility was under spiritual formation, prayer, spiritual disciplines. If that's something of interest to you, reach out to me through the Highlands Presbyterian website. I'm glad to talk to you or your church anytime. As a person in order and ministry, again, you'll conduct your life as a member, conduct your life as a member, you'll conduct your life, and therefore you will be honest and truthful in your relationship with others. And here we have the first of the examples of one standard that in its own way speaks to all three spheres of influence here. They're all essentially the same, but it's just their particular context. So nobody should be bearing false witness. Everybody should be speaking the truth in love, 
putting away falsehood. Nobody should be lying to one another. Doesn't matter who you are, if you're connected to the church, that's how it should be. And so we come back to our examples. In this case, and this is the one that um, it felt like God was in all Christian love just calling me out. A minister puts the wrong date in publicity for a church-wide dinner, or for example, perhaps a study for people to come to. Instead of blaming the error on the church secretary, he, in my case, accepts responsibility for his mistake. I won't deny that I was ready to scream when I saw the mistake that I had let get through. Um, because I didn't, I don't want to upset any, upset any of you. I, I don't want to make mistakes. It's embarrassing. Really, there's no upside to it. But these things happen. We all have a million responsibilities and a million details. And sometimes things just don't work as planned. You just didn't do all the things you could have done. But how we respond makes all the difference. To admit the mistake and do what you can to correct it speaks of being responsible, mature. But if you blame the other person, not only do you risk destroying the relationship with them, but all the people who see this, again, you're on stage, they see you yelling at an employee for a mistake that was made, and they do not see the love of Christ in your actions. And so you can lose trust. You can cause great pain and suffering with a lot of other people, even if you thought it was just you yelling at the secretary, and it was just the two of you. But in sound, on travels in buildings and people are, what's going on? That's what you want to avoid. Be responsible, be mature, mistakes happen. And so I'm going to trust that um, people I work with aren't going to yell at me for my mistake. <laughs> You'll notice this one, and this will be our last one for the night. Be faithful, keeping the covenants I make and honoring marriage vows. And we'll talk about covenants again in a little bit. But you'll see that this is not just about marriage. Abraham was not getting married to Abimelech. Abraham was making a deal, signing a contract with Abimelech. But as we see in Exodus, you shall not commit adultery or covet your neighbor's significant other. You can also see the Westminster Confession. An oath is to be taken in the plain and common sense of the words, without equivocation or mental reservation. And in the Confession of 1967, the reality that in 1967, people were looking at what sex means, birth control, in different ways. They were understanding that there are ways in which there's exploitation and alienation that can occur in sexual relationships. And to be honest, here we are, that's 1967. We're still unpacking that reality in 2024. We have not, we have not solved all of this, but we should be far more aware than we are. When it comes to any covenant, but especially marriage, this is a a hard standard sometimes to uphold, not because it's hard for you to keep the covenant you had made to other people necessarily, but because you may know things in other people's relationships that are contrary to the covenants that have been made or covenants that haven't been made. We're going to talk later about the difference between secrecy and confidentiality, but you may know something about someone and their partner doesn't know that thing. And what do you do? Because you're being faithful. You want to keep the marriage vows. You want to keep the covenants. And you're seeing right before your eyes, that's not happening. And it might not even be happening 
with someone who is in order in ministry who is held to a higher standard. You may feel as strongly about two single people living together as you do when someone is living with someone that they're not married to. Those are different, but you may feel just as strongly or you may feel they're somehow different. Or you may be perfectly aware of what scripture says in this plain and common sense of the words, but maybe you are less concerned about two single people living together, maybe because you know of their circumstances, you know they're getting married, you know they're saving rent until they can afford a place or afford to get married. And it may be that all this stuff I said is true and you're not going to file charges or do anything like that. But gosh, you, you feel uncomfortable because you just don't know what you're supposed to do, if you're supposed to do anything. But here's a living arrangement where this just isn't, it isn't settling right. You're just, you don't know the answer, but you're feeling your lack of knowledge. Because I'm not trying to hide from anything here. Here we see the Westminster Confession, and here it defines Christian marriage as one man, one woman. If, however, you look at the Directory for Worship, which came out in the last, well, the Directory for Worship and these words have been in for since 2015. Marriage involves a unique commitment between two people traditionally a man and a woman, to love and support each other for the rest of their lives. I found this very, not very helpful at all. Would you unmute um, yourself, please? Thank you. Um, as it turns out, the directory for worship reference is not in the standards booklet. So I'm not sure why, when they were updating things, maybe they just didn't think of it. And they just, I'm not sure. But this is one of those hot buttons in the church where many people aren't in the same place as they were before. Faithful people who aren't in the same place where the church was in 1647 when the Westminster Confession and uh, uh, Catechisms were uh, written. But whether we changed our standards in 2015 or not, it would not be honest to say that everybody is of one like mind on this topic. And there may be people here, I'm sure there are, who are all over the place if we took a poll on that. But this has been the church's stance since 2015. When we say the church reformed always to be reformed according to the word of God and the power of the spirit, this is what it means to be always reformed or always to be reformed, that what we believed in 1647 is not necessarily what we believe in 2015 or 2024. Um, and we're all moving targets on that. We could feel differently tomorrow than we do right now, based on any number of realities. This became a big deal in the discussion on um, freedom of conscience or the, on the discussion of human sexuality. And we're just about done once I lift this up. These apply to those in ordered ministry. So if you're a minister of ordinance sacrament, ruling elder, or deacon, this paragraph applies to you. It doesn't apply to all members. There are essentials to the Reformed faith, as it says here but they've never been defined and the church has never wanted to define them. As much as possible, we're to hold to the standards, realizing that we can only do as much as we can, but we cannot infringe on the rights and views of others and we can't obstruct the constitution. Which means the standard of the church is between two people. Traditionally a man and a woman, but two people. That's the standard by which we have to operate. And if we don't operate that way, we are obstructing the Constitution. 
With freedom of conscience, you can interpret scripture. I would suggest you you interpret it by scripture, translating scripture by the law of love, because those are ways in which our denomination understands interpreting scripture. Why I have this lifted up is we all have freedom of conscience. We believe what we believe. You can point to the Westminster Confessions, and that's great. You can point to chapter four in the directory of worship, and that's great. We have freedom to believe what we believe, but we have boundaries in scripture, tradition, constitution. We have boundaries in how the church is understanding these things. It's only a problem when those beliefs infringe on the rights and views of others, when it's my way or the highway that we have a problem. If you believe same-sex relationships are wrong, okay, that's what you believe. And if someone is up for election and they're in a same-sex relationship and you don't approve of such things, you are certainly welcome to vote against that. But once they are elected, if they are, and once they're ordained or installed, then we fall back on those questions asked of the congregation, and you're not answering those as an individual exclusively. The church, your congregation is saying, yes, we will respect this person's decisions. And if you're not willing to do that, then you need to have a conversation with your pastor because there's a conflict and the conflict is you're having trouble obeying a vow you have taken or the church has taken on your behalf. So again, however you feel, err on the side of grace. Be humble. Only be 99% sure that you are right. Because you could be wrong, and you may find later that you're wrong. You may find that there's more to the story than you know, and look at that. I had no idea. And those are wonderful things. And it would be wonderful if you think you're right about something, and it turns out when you're standing before God in heaven, you ask God, and God goes, yes, you were right all along. But you can't infringe on other people on this earthly plane. You can't infringe on their rights or their views or obstruct the Constitution. So on this question of covenant and vows, marriage or other things, just keep in mind there are limits to, yes, you have freedom of conscience, but that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Not that I expect any of you would have thought that, but if it comes up, now you've heard it. Um, all right, I'll do this next part fast. I want to make sure we start next time on a new. So first, be careful what you ask for. When it comes to employees and volunteers, you can't ask any of these questions. And as a consequence of not being able to ask any of these questions, that means you can't ask direct questions about all sorts of other things, like where do you go to church? What language do you speak at home? Why are you in a wheelchair? Why medications? What's your spouse or partner's name? Where were you born? You can't ask those things. And it's not just about being a, a good host or demonstrating good manners. That person, if they're of a mind to, they file a discrimination case against you. Um, this information comes, which you'd be able to see if the screen were full, from the Steinberg Law website. And this is what they say you can't do in New Jersey. And I'm sure they're telling you that, not so much as you, so you know, but because if you ask someone about their sexual orientation, they're going to go to the Steinberg Law website and look up, hey, are they allowed to ask me that? Because they may want to sue about a uh, discrimination question. If someone meets all the criteria you have to hire the person for this position, and they meet that criteria, and you hire them, you still can't ask those questions. Guess what? You can be a human being. You can ask questions in the basis of you're having a relationship with this new employee. So you don't walk up and go, so what's your spouse or partner's name? But in conversation, they're going to go, well, you know, Alicia's making dinner tonight. And you go, okay, well, I'm not sure exactly who Alicia is, but 
I've narrowed the field down. Then later I'll say, because I don't want to keep saying Alicia over and over again, well, my wife, she'll be waiting for me. And so just in normal relationships, you learn people just by talking to them. You don't need to ask specific questions that will possibly make someone uncomfortable and will possibly lead you into some kind of trouble yourself. And so when you get to the examples for this particular question, um, this is about vows, covenant. Um, so let's look get just at the second one. An elder finds himself attracted to a member of a committee, begins marriage counseling with his wife in order to strengthen his marriage. This is a mature, responsible thing. I can't imagine how hard that conversation is with, um, um, oh, wait, am I in the right one? Nope. Yeah, I did something wrong here. Trust me. So an elder who finds themselves attracted to a member begins marriage counseling. This is maturity to recognize they're in an unhealthy situation. They found a way to address it. It might have been a messy conversation with the spouse. But they are doing what they can to keep their marriage vows. And what more can you ask? A Stevens Ministry Committee member decides to make home visits in teams after one of their ministers is met by parishioners wearing a swimsuit. Trust me, this stuff happens. It does. So let me tell you, teams are always a good idea. Pastors can take elders or deacons to serve communion or to visit. You can bring members along as fellow visitors, companions, partners. If you can't find an elder or a deacon to come with you on home communion visits, it may not be perfectly according to what the Book of Order requests, but if you bring another member, that it's Jesus had the right idea. Traveling in pairs is the safest thing to do. And so however this shows up in your life, travel in pairs. Well, folks, I thank you very much for your patience with technology and time. And um, I can only ask that God would bless you and keep you safe in all your days ahead. And until we meet again next week. The peace of Christ be with you all. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thursday at 7.30. If anybody has any questions and they'd like to hang around, please do stay, and I'm glad to stay with you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks for being Steve. here.